Hello, welcome to our first National Academy of Construction Ask Me Anything for the fall 2020 semester. Really excited to be here. My name is Keith Molinar and I'm an NAC member and a professor and interim dean here at the University of Colorado Boulder. The National Academy of Construction was established to recognize our industry leaders. An important purpose of the Academy is to provide a network and a linkage between the past and the present in the construction industry. And as such, we've established this National Academy of Construction Ask Me Anything to help transfer knowledge from our members uh, to the next generation of construction leaders, which is you. So thank you for joining us. Um, our format's really simple. Um, our speakers make a short presentation about their career and their perspectives on the industry. If you've not already, please do email your questions to NACAMA at colorado.edu. Again, that's N-A-C-A-M-A, -A -A, one string, at Colorado, spelled out, dot edu. And one of the participants here at the end of the event will uh, win a $500 scholarship from the National Academy of Construction. So without any further ado here, I want to introduce our speaker. I'm just thrilled to have uh, Professor Jeffrey Russell with us. Um, he's been one of my mentors uh, for years, and he's currently the Vice Provost for Lifelong Learning and the Dean of the Division of Continuing Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Cincinnati and a master's and PhD degrees from Purdue University. Um, Jeff is a registered engineer in Wisconsin. I'm sure he's going to talk to you a little bit about what that means and, and why you might want to do that. Let me just tell you a little bit about his background and I'll, I'll turn it over to him. Um, he's been active in many professional societies, as you can see from his uh, resume. He's recognized by the American Society of Civil Engineers as a distinguished member back in 2009 and became a fellow of the National Society of Professional Engineers in 2011. Um, in 2014, ASCE recognized him with um, it's Outstanding Projects Leaders Award, the OPAL Award, which is one of their highest awards um, for extraordinary contributions to civil engineering over his 25-year career. He's published nearly 200 articles and technical reports and, and a few books. Um, just a bit more, Jeff grew up in a construction family. His father ran the operations of a small regional contractor in Northeast Ohio, and he spent his youth working in construction where he learned the value of hard work, integrity, and organization. Um, he's uh, learned a lot from his family and the family business, and Jeff values the importance of family, joys of life, and appreciates the differences. He's married and has five children. Um, so Jeff, coming to us from Madison tonight, thank you so much for, for taking the time. Um, wanted to give you a few minutes just to uh, do a brief presentation for us, and then we'll answer questions everybody. So again, if you haven't already, please do email questions to macama at colorado.edu. So Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Keith. That's a kind introduction and just a quick sound check. Am I coming through good? Yes. All right. Well. Thumbs up. All right. Well, it's uh, really exciting to uh, be asked to participate uh, with you tonight. I don't have, a, I just have a couple of slides and I just want to use those to set the table a little bit and as we think about transitioning to professional practice. So I'll have three points. The first one is, uh, you know, this whole notion of lifelong learning, as Keith pointed out, uh, if you look at, uh, I am uh, hold a current title of Vice Provost for Lifelong Learning on our campus. And my key point on this is to get you to think about uh, careers in a long life, unless uh, at least this book here by Groton and Scott indicates that unless you have a medical condition uh, in, in, a, uh, in a developed country like the United States, the likelihood of the young people listening to me that are going to live into their 90s and 100s is very, very likely. And I think that uh, introduces a number of lifelong learning uh, ways to think about this. It might not be career, it might be careers. Uh, it might be thinking more holistically about you individually, your own personal lifelong uh, interests and passions 
that you want to pursue. And I also think it's really important to focus in on the financial aspects. Uh, given I don't have to have a lot of discussion with all of us as we're all living through this COVID pandemic, uh, thinking about your financial security now, given that you're going to be living much, much longer, the likelihood I think is something that's really important. Now, a second point that I would make, and when I was an undergrad, I was uh, kind of, I'd say, confused a little bit, if you will, and uh, in, in, in the context of ethics. So my second point as we think about professional practice, I'm not talking about the National Society of Professional Engineers Code of Ethics or the ASC Code of Ethics. I think those embody the canons and principles that we agreed to, but what I find is the practical aspects of ethics are not easy. So I like this very practical definition, and that is ethics is doing the right thing even when it costs you more than you want to pay or more than you want to, to pay. And I think it's really important to think about that because doing the right thing when it costs you more than you want to pay, that's usually your time and that's usually your money. And it's much easier to listen to people articulate and pontificate, you know, on how they would never do something or this or that. And I think our goal as practitioners is to not be ethical, but to strive to practice ethically. And that means it's a constant stepping in the stream of different challenges, different issues uh, that we're going to confront. And habit does matter in getting those formed correctly on the front end can pay huge dividends. So ethics and ethical practice over a lifetime, a long lifetime of multiple careers or perhaps one career and professional interest is important. Then my third point is that, and, and this is, is really being brought to, to, to bear in terms of as we're thinking about more of the social related issues that we're confronted with. And, you know, what I would say uh, from my generation's perspective, um, I don't think when you think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, diversity means to me is uh, representativeness matters. Um, when you look around the room and you see who's participating, my lived experience has been predominantly white men. And what I've been able to see is progress in particular for women and other ethnic minorities. But there's just, there's a lot of opportunity for us to think about as an industry around diversity. Now, the notion of equity, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, not all of us uh, have the same opportunities. And I think it is important for us to think about, at least my lived experience is, a lot of the things that I got access to were because of my positional, uh, family positional power, uh, represent, you know, their representativeness in the community and the, ch the opportunities that I was given. Now that doesn't mean that everybody, uh, that this is easy to do, but I do think it's important for us to be mindful of this and how are we helping others that might not have the same opportunities. And then the inclusion to me is, you know, the big thing I wanna focus on there is culture. Uh, to me, inclusion has elements of diversity. I mean, it's different, but it's also uh, allowing people to share uh, different ideas and different approaches. And I think that uh, the inclusion aspect is also really, really important. So I just wanted to, to offer that as we think about lifelong learning, we have to think about this over a lifetime. It has many different dimensions. Uh, I'm sure there'll be questions on this. I wanted to plant the seed. I'm not gonna stand up here and lecture to you about I'm ethical in every situation in my life because I can't say that and it's a challenge. And I think that for us going forward, issues of diversity, equity and inclusion they're important to us socially and in particular for our important industries. So with that, Keith, I'll stop there and uh, let's uh, go to the questions. I really am looking forward to uh, the engaging student questions and uh, I hope you'll help me out when I get stumped. But, yeah, thank you for the introduction. We really do have a lot of excellent questions. It looks like we have over a hundred attendees. So. Everybody, welcome. Um, we really do appreciate you coming. There's a, a lot of questions around the pandemic, Jeff, so I thought we'd 
we would start there, if that's okay. Um, uh, Geraldine is talking about how it's relating to um, uh, offers and uh, saying that some of her and some of her colleagues have had offers rescinded. Um, so how do you see people using or working um, in this area, even to leverage it to help help find them work, um, help find work? So around COVID, what do you see the employment like and how can students leverage the situation? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And I think it's a Clearly, it's something that we're all living through. Let, let me let me first say, um, you know, the health and safety. I mean, this global pandemic is something that at least in anybody that's likely on the uh, that that is on uh, the, the program tonight with us, we we've not seen anything like this, and I think. Um, there is no question this is a major disruption and it is gonna change a lot of things in a lot of areas around the world. Now, as it relates to uh, specifically opportunities, um, I think clearly there are parts of the economy doing very well and there are other parts of the economy that aren't. So the question is if you're strongly interested in engineering, let's say versus construction, and you have very place-based uh, areas that you might need to be, there might not be the same area uh, opportunities. And so I think uh, my reading of this is, is that uh, we will get to the other side of this at some point. Uh, I think it's really important to uh, be positive. Well, first you gotta be safe in my judgment, be safe, take care of your loved ones. You wanna take care of yourself and you want to then think about if in fact uh, there have been setbacks where you haven't, uh, where offers have been rescinded, how do you take advantage of the opportunity to the, the, uh, the time that you have? Does that mean that you might want to think about working on an at a distance master's degree? Uh, might you want to think about some other opportunities that are going to give you some other experience? Could be in the service industry, for example. I would look for and use this as an opportunity to think about how you can turn a current, what I'd call a uh, set of circumstances that are not positive into something that allows you to continue to build your knowledge, build your skills and continue to be open to ideas. And then as these things come available to you, I think, um, you know, it's in my judgment, a young person's game, I think uh, there's plenty of opportunity for talented, motivated, uh, committed, ethical uh, folks in the marketplace. Great. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I know in Colorado here, our industry and our advisory board have said their backlogs so the projects are still quite large and um, still moving along, so I know there's a lot of opportunity. Um, Carter asks a good question. Um, do you believe the pandemic will decrease the amount of face-to-face -face interactions, and if so, how will we interact and, and how can um, students leverage that? Maybe you can even, Jeff, draw a little bit from your experience in um, distance learning and, and uh, teaching online and such. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's another super question. I mean, I, I, l let me back up and just simply say, I think the pandemic is going to restructure uh, what constitutes work and where work is done. I can't definitively tell you how that's going to look in all different organizations, but in an organization that I'm in, I don't expect all of us to be in resident at the same location all the time. I think there's going to be a lot more job sharing and at a distance uh, collaborative work. So that's one observation. I think uh, as it relates to, um, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of when you have two sets of circumstances and you can't move one, it usually takes an externality. Um, I have always at least philosophically believed in the teaching and learning side that technology can enhance the student learning experience. That's not something that's universally accepted or agreed upon among all educators, and I don't want to get into a big debate about that. But if you look at the learning science, and if you look at the delivery platforms, and we think about and use our training as engineers, we got to ask ourselves, can we design better learning? And I think it doesn't mean it's all online, but I think what it does mean for many of you, I think, is if you choose to do post-baccalaureate 
network or if you're in a larger organization that has a learning organization or if you're in a small organization and you're making your own investments and in your own skills and lifelong learning, you are going to access technology delivered education. It's likely going to be over time more personalized. You're going to push the cost curve down. It's not going to be as expensive. And I think you're going to have a lot more open sources. If they post, uh, uh, if they post the slides, I have one slide at the end that has an open textbook, for example. I think there's going to be a lot more resources like open textbooks, like open courses like Coursera and edX and several others. So I think that um, I think face-to-face -face on the high value pieces will be here to stay. We have to deal with, you know, being able to do it at the moment, physically distance and, done, and, and do it safely. And I, I do think the interactions, the personal interactions do matter, but I think that uh, this pandemic is going to really have us examining a lot of the things that we do from a workflow and a process perspective. And I think there's going to be good things. I think there's a lot of down things that come from it. And if we have more time, maybe we can talk about that too. Good. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. I think that's enough for the uh, pandemic questions here. There's some couple other themes I'm seeing. Um, some are relating to education and career path. Um, a few others to just uh, general skills to succeed. Let me start with a, a couple on the career path. Um, Jeannie asks, what's the suggested timeline for EIT, FE, PE? So thinking about that professional licensure. And may, maybe if I could yeah. expand that too. Um, talk a little bit about professional licensure if you're going to work for a construction firm in particular. Yeah, I, I, well, yeah, L let me try to tackle that. So there's a question. So the here, let me step back and, and make my primary argument here. My primary argument is you don't go to a physician that's not licensed. Um, in my opinion, it doesn't mean if somebody in construction is not licensed, they're not a professional. But from a public facing point of view, if you're a professional, you have the appropriate education and other credentials. Licensing is part of that. So there's mixed views in the construction industry, whether you need to be licensed, not to be licensed. My advice over the years has been to encourage students to be licensed because I believe that if you're a professional and you have those opportunities and you're to promote and protect public health, safety, and welfare, being licensed matters. Now let's talk about the process. The process is if you have an ABAT accredited, there's 55 different jurisdictions in the United States, and we don't have time to get into all the details, but the, the prerequisites to become licensed are you need a accredited bachelor's degree, which you're all in programs that have an accredited bachelor's degree in engineering, in the case probably civil engineering or perhaps construction engineering. Um, from there, most states require four years of progressive experience. And when you t and you're in your bachelor's degree, you want to take your principles and practice or what is called your, I'm sorry, not principles and practice, but your fundamentals in engineering, your FE exam. So if you have your degree, your education, combined then with passing the eight-hour uh, fundamentals and engineering exam, most jurisdictions require you or some to to work four years of progressive experience and then set for the principles and practice exam. You have to have five external references. If you pass a principles and practice exam, you have the five references and you, and you pass the exam, you become licensed as a PE. Some will allow you to take the principles and practice exam right after you take, for example, the fundamentals and engineering exam. So here's the upshot. You need two eight-hour exams you need to pass. You need four years of progressive experience. If you're in California or Washington and you're going to go into structural engineering, you'll have some additional things that you'll have to uh, do due to the seismic related requirements. But uh, that's, that's the steps. Um, and, and I'm high on licensure. I think it's important. I think it's a public facing um, communication. I mean, People that use the word professional engineer 
should not do so unless they're licensed because that has a particular meaning in state statutes and uh, different parts of the country. So again, great question. Great. Thanks, Jeff. A um, number of uh, participants here are asking about um, graduate level degrees. Uh, Nathania and Kyle are asking about MBAs and Jacob's asking just more about a, um, a master's degree in general. So what do you, what are your views on um, getting a graduate degree after finishing your, your bachelor's degree and how that might help you in the construction industry? Yeah, I, um, two points. Um, it's not for everybody. Uh, I don't think it's a prerequisite that you have to do it. Uh, I think um, if circumstances like the first question that, you know, you've had a job that maybe hasn't worked out, might pursuing a graduate degree make sense while you sort things out and let the economy or maybe your life choices sort itself out. Uh, in my opinion, what I've tried to say, I've, what I've tried to do is use myself as uh, at least one illustration. Uh, as, as Keith pointed out for me, I knew after undergraduate degree, he commented my father ran a construction company. I knew if I went to industry, the likelihood that I would ever go back for education was fairly slim. And this was, I lived at a, I mean, my, you know, graduated in 85. That was a time where you didn't have any distance options. I mean, that you could work and go to school. It's either you, you were place-based for your master's or you weren't. If I didn't do mine then, I would have never done it. And the primary motivation that I had was I was still curious. I still felt there was a lot that I needed to learn. I knew education in and of itself because I grew up in the field. My father, as I said, as Keith said, ran a construction company. I spent a lot of time on the end of a number two shovel being ribbed by, you know, laborers and carpenters and foremen and superintendents telling me, you know, all you highfalutin education kind of people, this and that and the other thing. And, you know, I, I fully understood what that meant, but I really wanted it because I wanted to add depth and breadth to my undergraduate experience. And I wanted to then, you know, this curiosity with that goal then led me to go on for my PhD. But that, you know, again, might not be for everybody. I think education is an investment and the investments I've made in a master's and PhD have paid spades to me. I mean, it's been a part of the lifelong learning elements. I don't think you have to do it now. You don't have to have everything figured out. My generation was much more get an MBA. Uh, I, I, I didn't typically recommend or I don't recommend that to a student unless they fully want to get out of engineering and construction, uh, because I just don't think, and if you know anything about MBA programs around the country, uh, they're all struggling. They're, you know, they cover a lot of different things. Um, you're not going to at 22 run a company at, you know, 23, you're not going to come out with an MBA and start your entry level job in the C-suite. So I think that's a later kind of thing. I've seen a lot more engineers get more technical it might be structures or it might be geotechnical or construction engineering or it might be construction management and then go on, get a lot of good field experience, some practical traveling around, working on great jobs, working on great teams, and then maybe doing an executive MBA or maybe then doing an MBA because they're going to help maybe do more strategy in the organization or you're going to build out a unit that's going to create a new operating unit, let's say in power or in transportation. So I think it's, it, it, it highly depends. It's very, very personalized. I can tell you from experience, if it's not something you want to do, uh, it normally shows. And I think that's the thing. You, you got to have the interest and the passion and the desire to do it. And I enjoyed my graduate education because I enjoyed learning. And I enjoyed learning not because I had to take a test to show I could you know, solve a particular problem and be compared to everybody else in class. But it was more of an intellectual development of stretching my mind, getting me to think deeper and broader, helping open up my eyes to different possibilities. So as you can tell, I 
can maybe go, well, I'm going on and on. I am very passionate about this. I think it's, it's an investment, but it's all about you and uh, what's going to work for you. And I think, uh, I do think that having mentors that can give you input on this would be a, you know, a piece of advice that I would give you is, you know, talk to a couple of different people. Don't expect all the same answers. Listen to their arguments and stories, and maybe that'll help you make your decision. Great. Thanks, Jeff. That's, um, I know uh, some students look at a graduate degree because they do want to get into um, management. Uh, Jeff, here I'll put it in the chat here. Jeff is asking, um, what's a typical career path taken towards management? So perhaps it doesn't always involve a graduate degree. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you've seen um, as a typical career path that people would like to get into management and leadership in the future? Well, I, you know, again, another excellent question. Uh, I think, um, again, this is me philosophically, others might disagree. I, I think to the extent that you can do it, uh, the more you understand the core business that you're in and the more experience you have in that, the better positioned you will be uh, to lead and to manage. And I, we can get into that. I, leadership is not management, but management is not leadership. But I see in some cases you need both of them in today's more complex world, at least running work, running major projects. And that's different than running an organization, a, you know, a large Kiwit or uh, you know, Turner or someone like that. So I, I think, uh, you know, uh, my observation is that um, understanding, at least let me speak to construction, understanding how the work gets done, understanding the field, whether you want to be a structural engineer, or you want to be, um, you know, a construction manager, I think understanding and being out in the field and understand how important the field uh, team is, how important you think about buildability, how important you think about designing safety into buildability and quality and sustainability, all those other kind of things, I think will make you a better uh, manager. And uh, so I, I think a lot of field experience, you can read this stuff and then, you know, one of my biggest things that I try to emphasize is uh, there's a professor at, at, at uh, at USC called McCall, and he talks about a, to the extent something is learned, it's learned through experience. And one of the things about being in the field is you get direct, this is not a textbook, I mean, you'll have background of that, but in the field is where you can get direct field experience. That's where 70% of the learning of many individuals come. 20% can come from peers, and from mentors, and 10% will come from a formal academic class. Now, I'm talking in this broad sense of, of management. So I think to the extent that things are really learned and really understood in the management leadership space, i am kind of hinted to it a little bit on the ethics side, it's learned through experience. I mean, I've made a large number of mistakes or things I would have done differently on the management and leadership side on all of the items that I just discussed. Thanks, Jeff. Let me um, bridge here. There's a, a good question from, from Kayla. I'll read it and also put it up in the chat for you. Um, bridging uh, leadership and also in inclusion and equity. So as a winner of the Opal Leadership Award, what's your advice to students like myself who would like to make engineering education more accessible historically underrepresented individuals and those individuals with disabilities. What concrete action can we take to diversify our industry? Yeah, that's, um, you know, that, that's a, a really important question. And I think that um, all of us approach and can contribute to that in different ways. Uh, if you would ask me what what I've tried to do in my career in particular is I focus my time on trying to work with women. I, when I looked around the country and my lived experience was very, very few women were in construction. And so I tried to use my influence as teaching undergraduate courses and helping students get placements 
uh, and internships and job placements uh, to encourage them that the industry is a place where they could succeed. They could have a, a great career and can make significant contributions. I think that um, back to the COVID discussion um, and, and back to the equity point that I was trying to make, not everybody has the same access and the same opportunities, whether it's technology, whether it's an informal mentor system, whether it's kind of understanding how, the, how, how college really works. So I think our challenge going forward is uh, individually within our own sphere of people that we touch, uh, how, how can we encourage talented people uh, that can really help make a difference? Um, you know, access to opportunity is something that many, many people uh, really want. We have many, many talented people that just don't have the same opportunities but are capable and we all need to help them. Sometimes it's uh, being exposed. Sometimes it's there to help them uh, as they're making a, a decision on perhaps a, a, a particular degree that they might pursue. It might be networking them to get them placed uh, in the industry. Uh, I, but I think these are all things we can do individually. Um, Personally, I think that uh, there's a lot of things that senior leaders can do uh, in organizations. If you think about, um, you know, things that, you know, let me just tell you things. I'm not specifically practicing in the construction industry as such, but in an organization like ours, uh, I'm keenly involved with in shaping our human resource strategy on how I'm trying to move forward and what uh, uh, building a more diverse organization. And so some of this comes down to senior leaders that they, in my judgment, have to step up and they've got to help enable uh, and create an environment where folks can succeed that are different than we are. They're not, they don't have the same background, though all the kind of things that I was just talking about in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so I think that, you know, it's a leadership issue, and I also think we all individually uh, can make contributions there. I don't think people want to read more statements, and I think a lot of people just, uh, that, I mean, I think you're at the end of your question of this the concrete steps. I think you're after, you know, what can, what are we tangibly going to do that's going to lead to different outcomes? And I think part of it is leadership, and it's our own contributions to help reshape the profession by attracting and nurturing and developing talented people different than we are. Great, great advice, Jeff. I, I really appreciate that. And I guess I would share here at the University of Colorado, we've done a great job with our, our freshman class representing the demographics of our, of our state, but our underrepresented students are not graduating at the same rate. And uh, I would just put a call out to all of you here to work as mentors and work as peers um, to make sure that uh, everybody is successful in graduating along, along with you and um, think of it uh, throughout your career. So actions are immediate, but they're also gonna be throughout your career. We have a, a lot to change in the industry and society. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's an important time. Um, Jeff, I'm going to ask you, kind of paraphrase three, three questions here from uh, Maria, Raymond, and Jesus. Um, they're all wondering about balancing um, career and um, family and uh, personal lives in an industry that can historically be so, so many hours and so intense as a construction industry. Um, I know you you really do an excellent job balancing with your family and, and your life. Do you have any advice along those lines? Well, first of all, Keith, I appreciate the compliment, but I wouldn't say I've been uh, I wouldn't say I would be the role model in all cases. Um, you know what 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 I would say is that um, I think that um, there are generations that just have not balanced well at all. Um, you know, it's 24 seven, you know, the expectations of different things. I mean, the colleagues that I know, let me just speak to my own, you know, 
folks that I know in terms of the academic side. If you would, um, I still work pretty darn hard, but it, it comes down to when you're really passionate about what you're doing, um, you have to tell yourself that you got a balance and things with time and as you get more experience, I mean, that becomes more evident. Um, I think that there are phases and again, you know, this is very individualized, so I don't want to overly generalize, but early in my career, I had a lot of things yet to learn and I was putting some time on task uh, to understand whether that was when I was a co-op student in Hartford, Connecticut on the Hartford steam boiler job, where I wanted to understand, you know, how we put up precast parking decks and how we maintain a six day rotation schedule to meet the demands of uh, Gerald E. Hines at that time, which was the large developer. So I think that I would look at these things as, uh, you know, again, back to investments and, you know, balance to play the long game is really important. And, you know, you can't, um, you don't want to lose your family and you don't want to lose your health. And so you just have to really work through uh, those kind of things. Now, one of the things that I, I will say that I hope COVID will help us do, those of you that are taking courses or familiar with lean, you know, there's a lot of things that we do in construction that is a lot of waste, okay, and it wastes a lot of time. Okay, people expected to be there a lot. Um, and, you know, are we really working and are we really adding value? So I, I hope that, that uh, we can, you know, also think about what we're trying to do to balance things in a way that um, get rid of things that kind of can be a, a culture, if you will, an organization or a project can have a culture. And that's not always good. It's not always good uh, for many of the things that I've talked about earlier. So, I wish I had like super concrete advice to say it was easy. Um, I've enjoyed my work, you know, as the quote goes, you know, I've have had a few rough days. Uh, one, today might be semi rough for a variety of reasons that I'm not gonna get into, but I think by and large, uh, I've loved what I've done, uh, my, the, my profession, and I think it is, um, it can be demanding, so. Great, Nick. Um, Jacob was asking a little bit more on your perspective on lean. You just, just mentioned that. Can you talk a little bit about how you think lean has changed, um, lean methods have changed our industry over your career? Yeah, no, well, l l let, me, l let me just try to, you know, I I'm not, uh, we lost Professor Howell, for example. There's Glenn Ballard. There's Iris Tomlin. I mean, there's many, many people in our academic professional side and in industry that are just great leaders in this. Martin Fisher would be another one at Stanford. Um, here's my reading of, of lean. Um, there's a big difference between push and pull. And I think that's a fundamental concept. And when you're constantly pushing and you have contract structures and incentives that optimize at the individual and you don't have the incentives aligned to allow you to pull from the customer. I think that, um, I think you can have a built building that doesn't always meet its intended function or need. So I think there can be some mismatch there. But I think lean is, it's, 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 a, it's a cognitive reframe of how you think about the work, how you think about flow, how you think about interdependence, how you think about variability. And I think, uh, you know, and, you know, as we know, embedded in a lot of that is uncertainty. So um, I think that uh, the new approaches that have been taken, I mean, we have a graduate, uh, Professor Hannah's student uh, was working on the Cathedral Hill project. David Tomac was a project manager and uh, out in California, supposedly one of the first hospitals that was ever completed on time and within budget right downtown San Francisco. And, and, you know, when you go out, when Awad and I went out and visited the job, I mean, it's a totally different approach. But it started with a contract and with the owner and with the context. And then with how the work, 
how they, you know, did value-based design, how they really planned their work, how they sequenced their work, how they really tried to take waste out of uh, construction operations, be sensitive to safety. I just think it's, it's a fundamentally different way to think about the work rather than just who's low and how do you get it done and, and, and you know, within the time and, and whatever your margin is, make that. It's just a whole different customer fa facing approach to what you're trying to do. Great. Thanks. Boy, time's going quickly here. We're down to just, just over five minutes left. So just to give you a heads up there, Jeff. Um, there's a number of questions about um, sustainability and impacts on the, um, the construction industry on our environment. I, I just put, put one up in the chat there. Um, construction is a very big contributor to our to climate change and global warming, how can we improve the sustainability aspect in construction? Yeah, I think, I mean, as we're talking about lean, I, I think we have to continue to work to uh, educate owners. And I think, you know, they're a really important part of that. And then we all individually, I think, um, you know, I, I'm so impressed with the, the gen two generations behind us uh, or behind me that, I just think are able to think about things in a different way and I think can lead in a different way. And so I would just encourage all of you to continue to ask those questions uh, because these kind of questions that are being asked are thinking questions. They're not, you know, do this, do this, do this. I think this requires the degree of engagement and across the complete industry to say, you know, how can we do better if we care about generations behind us, uh, these are important things to consider. So again, I don't, you know, this is the sustainability thing is really not my area of expertise as such, but I think the basic notion that, you know, we should be thinking about how to be better stewards of the, the natural and the built environment, I think are important elements. Um, I have a question from Dorothy here about how should you approach um, learning ethics throughout your career? So kind of a lifelong learning idea around, around ethics. I know it's difficult sometimes for um, undergraduates without a lot of experience to, to really get their arms around. So what are your suggestions around lifelong learning? ethics? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I just strongly encourage you to do a couple of things. One is to be observant and just look around you. I, you don't have to be my age at 58 to observe what's going on. And you can see things. And you know, one of the things I've observed is if your gut tells you something's not right, your intuition, you're usually right. Don't, don't second guess yourself two and three times. You all have a lot of experience in this. I mean, I'll just reveal something I was, if we had more time in ethics, you know, it's a difficult thing for me as a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, and I would just telling you about, you know, you know, practical experience and this and that and the other thing. Um, when, when students ask me, hey, professor, have you ever cheated on a homework assignment or doing something? I have to answer that question, yes. And you'll ask the question, why would he do that? And that's because I was more interested in drinking beer than I was doing the work. Now, I use that example to try to say that um, this is situational and, you know, what I do know from lived experience is the risks that you face as you, as, as you grow and in, in, in the consequences of making unethical decisions are very, very significant. And so, and it's like a glass vase. You don't want to break that. And so, I don't make the argument. That's why I was trying to make the argument on the front end. We don't have to be perfect, but we have to strive to practice our work ethically. I think you want to observe around you. You want to read. There's a lot of good literature out there on getting you to think about things in advance of ethical situations. Um, and you want to have mindfulness of that because um, I would never do that. I can't believe they would do that. Be careful, context situations can be much stronger than your values, than your norms under the certain circumstances. And I just think that's human nature and it's just being, it's being wise and mindful that, you know, you never step in the same river twice and that's ethics. 
it's never the same situation. The circumstances usually are never the same. And that's why you've got to keep learning as to what are appropriate normative behaviors and what aren't, and then form good habits to put yourself in a situation that you don't do something that you might later regret. Great. Thanks, Jeff. We have so many good questions. We're just running out of time here. Let me see if we can do a couple quick ones, and then I want to announce our winner of our scholarship. Award. So um, you were just mentioning books. Uh, Daniel was asking, can you provide some book recommendations that have been helpful to you in your career? Yeah, there's, a, in fact, one of these I've got right now I'm reading is uh, Love Works, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, this uh, seven uh, timeless principles for effective leaders. Um, I think that, you know, I've been reading a lot of those kind of things. I mentioned the, you know, the 100 Year Life book uh, earlier. Uh, so I've been trying to think about some more topical things based on where I'm trying to lead and manage. Uh, I would also say that um, I have an interest in history, you know, the presidents, uh, Truman, uh, Abraham Lincoln. So I think, you know, there's a lot to be learned in history. You know, as we know, some of these things are just being repeated. But I think, you know, having a wide array of, of books, but the, you know, the Love Works book combined then with the 100 Year Life would be two recommendations that I would make. And then I would say having some interest outside I find particularly the older I get, I do enjoy history and, and um, understanding how things work. Um, you know, so, you know, very simple things of the evolution of the paperclip. And there's just all these other really good books out there that uh, I think, uh, you know, can be helpful. And then you might just have some other general reading. I don't tend to do a lot of that. I try to try to read The Economist and I try to keep up with the New York Times a little bit. And then, you know, a few of these other things are things that, I, and I do still read Engineering News Record, DNR, weekly. So those are some things that, that I look at. The Economist, New York Times, ENR, and then a few other books that I read. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. Um, here's a good one from Amy. Um, what are some examples of when you chose to step outside your comfort zone? And what were the outcomes? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, well, I would say, uh, you know, coming from uh, for Northeast Ohio, I mean, uh, my father was not an engineer. And I think I grew up, as, as Keith mentioned, in a very small, I'd call blue collar town. Um, and I think, you know, when I showed up at the University of Cincinnati, I kind of had this imposter syndrome. And I kind of wondered if I really belonged or fit in and uh, in it you know even though my father did go to Purdue and eventually did graduate um, you know and I had that benefit I still was second guessing myself as to whether I could you know really succeed in engineering school and there and I think that's one of the things that's drawn me to education is is that I I still feel that way at times, and I feel like I can connect with students uh, when I'm actively engaged because I think I understand that uh, we all have insecurities, and I think that's not bad, but I do think what you do with them does matter, and I do think back to the question on how can we encourage more diversity in others, the ability to communicate confidence in somebody else is a real gift, and it's it's not trying to it's not trying to pump them up to somebody that they're not. It's trying to build connection and community with them that they know you care and that you know that they can do it and that you're on their side. So I think that's something that's really, really uh, important. You know, I would say the same thing happened to me going to graduate school in Purdue. I mean, I just didn't really wasn't sure. And then uh, from Purdue, come to Wisconsin. I mean, I've seen Wisconsin on the map. I knew two things about Wisconsin. It was always dark blue on the weather map, and they always beat Ohio State the ninth game of the season. Okay, those are the two things I knew about Wisconsin, and I didn't really know if I could make it at a Big Ten university, you know, as a faculty member. I mean, you know, I grew up in a family. It's like, oh, you, you even went to college was a big deal, but, and I'm not trying to downplay that, but it's, 
some egg-headed, my father, by the way, would use different language that I won't repeat here, but would call me some egghead professor. And uh, so, I mean, it's, it's just, we all have these things of each of those steps and this position that I'm in now, could I do it? I think each one I've tried to step up, learn, step up, learn, step up and learn. And, you know, whether it's a department chair, trying to work on a program, meeting with students, doing research, being a vice provost. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's been fun. And my big challenge now, or my big stepping out now is to try to figure out, and this was a question that was asked kind of earlier, it, I'm trying to think carefully about what areas I can spend my discretionary time and use my influence to make a difference. And, you know, so I'm thinking hard about that, you know, housing insecurity, food insecurity in our community, access to education. These are things I'm thinking about as to how can I have the most impact and use my influence? And then how might that play into my next career that I can help make a difference uh, in some of these important social issues too? So that's probably more than you wanted, Keith. But yeah, there's the, uh, you got to step out and you got to step up. Sometimes you fall down, you got to dust yourself off and just keep moving. You got to keep moving. Well, Jeff, that, that is our, our time. Spectacular answer there. I think it's a wonderful answer to kind of bring us to a, a close, too. But I wanted to just give you one last chance to leave any advice for our participants who are listening today. Well, if, if you look at, uh, if they post the slides, if Jane and Keith post the slides, my, uh, you know, I have three pieces of advice. One is have a growth mindset and inv invest in yourself and others and be a curious learner. And I think, you know, I've made the point on ethics. It's just, uh, you know, I, I would not, and I do not use words like I will never do that. Um, be on guard and be attentive, and be observant of what's happening around you because your best intentions, your values and beliefs under the wrong set of circumstances can lead you to make decisions that are not good. My last point that I'll make is, and it's tied to the, diversity, equity, and inclusion, I have learned in my life, I'm a walking set of biases. These biases have been created by my own life and lived experiences. They're not the same as everyone else and they color or they influence the way I see the world. And I'm trying to learn and I think it's important to be aware of and sensitive to what are your biases and make sure that they don't um, in, uh, in a way to discriminate or create situations that uh, you don't look at things in a more holistic way and you're not inclusive and you don't create access and opportunity for others. So Keith, those would be a couple of things that I've thought about that, you know, I could leave you with and, uh, and I'm a work in progress. I'm 58 and I'm chugging, man. I'm keep going. I'm, I'm going to keep uh, moving, keep learning, keep being curious try to make the right decisions, try to do the right things, try to be a positive influence. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have invested in my success and it's only appropriate that I invest in others. So thanks, Keith and Jane and the, the group. It's been a great time. I hope you've got something out of it. Uh, and I sure have in preparing and answering, uh, trying to answer your questions. So thank you. Jeff, thank you for all the insights and um, Again, thank you for all the inspiration you've lent to so many students and, and faculty like myself around around the country throughout your career. You've really made a big impact and I appreciate you taking the time today to, to give us those words. Um, we do need to wrap up and I wanted to announce our winner of the $500 National Academy of Construction Scholarship. I'd like to thank the National Academy of Construction for sponsoring this and actually all of the members for donating the the funds that support it as well. So um, Hope Hang from the University of California, Berkeley, you're our winner today and we will uh, be in contact with you via email to get you that, uh, those funds to support your education. And so um, yeah, again, Jeff, thank you for the inspiration today. Thank you everyone for joining us and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again in another month. Thanks. Thanks again.